I get a lot of questions about skincare every single day and I love to answer all of them. So I thought, why not do a skincare Q&A video? I think it's time, right? So I asked you guys here on YouTube as well as on Instagram some of your burning questions. So give this video a big thumbs up because here are the answers. <music> first question is about facial oils. Specifically, where do I order oil in my routine? Do I put it before moisturizer or do I put it after moisturizer? So first things first, I think this is kind of one of those subjects that's pretty personal and I feel like there really is no right way to do it. But I will tell you how I do it. So the first thing that I do is I have to consider what type of oil am I looking at, specifically the fatty acid composition of the oil. This sounds a little bit too, um, too scientific, I know, but seriously, Google is your best friend. What I do is I find out if the oil is high in linoleic acid or if the oil is high in oleic acid. Now, oils that are high in linoleic acid, these are the, the types of oils that are really good for your moisture barrier. These are the oils that dive in deep into your skin, that really nourish your skin, that heal your moisture bar barrier, who, that really kind of helps prevent transepidermal water loss. So those types of oils, if I find out that it's high in oleic acid, I place that oil in my routine before moisturizer. My theory on that is that I want it as close to my skin as possible, as, as close as it can get as an oil without disrupting my hydrating thinner layers beforehand. Um, I want it to put it in before moisturizer because really the function of the oil is to treat my skin rather than to create an occlusive barrier. And an occlusive barrier is going to be created by oleic acid oils. These are the ones that are going to kind of just lock in the layers. That's really the function of oleic acid in skincare. So when it comes down to it, if I find out that the oil is linoleic, I'll place it before my moisturizer. If I find out that the oil is high in oleic acid, then I'm either going to mix it into my moisturizer or put it on top of my moisturizer because in my opinion, those two oils, those two types of fatty acids do serve two different purposes. So question number two is what is my hair care routine? And I have to be honest with you, I don't neglect my hair, but I definitely don't put as much energy into my hair as I do with my skincare. But I will share some of the products that I use on a regular basis because I have some tried and tested products that I really love when it comes to hair. Now my hair type is pretty thick, it's long, and it's also um, been color treated as well. So some of my concerns with my hair is I just really want it to be healthy. I want to make sure that it um, feels soft, that it's shiny, and that the strands are strong. So one of my favorite shampoo and conditioners that I've used for quite a while now is the Shiseido Subaki Extra Moist Shampoo and Conditioner. Um, I buy this on Amazon and I really like this because not only does it give my hair a really nice clean, but it's very gentle on my hair. Um, I first started using this after I had bleached my hair blonde um, a couple of years ago and I found that this really kind of helped restore the, the health of my hair and the moisture of my hair. So it's really good for hair that's been chemically treated. It's good for hair that's really dry, um, but it's not too heavy. I feel like some, you know, some hair care products can be very heavy. Uh, so I usually will uh, shampoo and condition with that. When I get out of the shower, what I really like to do is just put on some type of hair serum. And one of my favorites, longtime favorites, this is a Korean brand. This is Mise en Scene, and this is their Perfect Repair Hair Serum. Um, I've gone through quite a few bottles of this. What's nice about this is it's never oily, it's never greasy. Um, you can put a good amount on to your hair and really work it through pretty close to the scalp without getting any kind of oiliness, but it really smooths down the hair, it protects it, um, it nourishes it, it really helps prevent split ends as well. So I really like that one. I'm not a big fan of air, of uh, using a hair dryer, to be honest with you, because when you have longer hair that's thicker, it can take a really long time to dry with a hair dryer. So I'm actually a pretty big fan of air drying. Um, I try to limit my exposure to the hair dryer as well, just because that's something that really seems to frizz out my hair. It seems to damage my hair. So I really do try to either like half air dry and then blow dry the rest after it's air dried for a while or just completely air dry. Um, that's just that's just me. Uh, and it works out okay for my hair. 
I do obviously use curling irons and um, flat irons, but I do try to reduce the amount of heat with the uh, hair dryer. Um, another kind of product that I want to mention that I really like for my hair as well as far as deep conditioning treatments I like to do maybe one a week if I can remember I told you I, I kind of neglect my hair and one of my favorite deep conditioners is the Aussie three-minute miracle mask it's super cheap it's available in most drugstores at least here in the US and it really does help restore uh, moisture into the hair it really helps kind of restore shine into the hair and I really like it because it's only three minutes but it seems to do the trick. So question number three is can you over moisturize? And my answer to this is yes. Of course it is always possible to overuse a product. And another part of the question was you know what are the signs that you have over moisturized? And in my opinion the biggest sign that you've maybe overused your moisturizing products is when your skincare layers don't really seem to sink into your skin but rather they're sitting on top of your skin. You know your skin feels heavy, maybe it feels like there's a residue on top of your skin. You know those layers just aren't absorbing effectively. And that's going to tell that's going to be a sign that there's a little bit too much that is not able to be absorbed into the skin. So that's kind of the number one uh, sign and it is possible if you're using too rich of a product especially if it's not right for your skin type that's another way to over moisturize without necessarily using too much product if you're using the wrong type of moisturizer for your skin type that can easily sit on top of your skin that's something that's also um, possible that you're going to start exposing yourself to the possibility of congesting your skin as well you might see more blackheads more clogged pores if you're using too rich of a product for your skin so question number four was actually a really interesting one to look into and think about, and that was um, about the hygiene between cream products or powder products, and I think this is more specifically for makeup, and I found this one really interesting um, as far as like the, the hygiene concerns between the two. Now the first thing that I sort of thought about with this question is the expiration dates of like your powder compacts versus like your cushion, um, your cushion blushes or your cushion foundations and you know the light the shelf life of a powder product is usually like two to three years it's actually pretty long for a powder product but when you're looking at like a cream product or even like a cushion foundation you're looking at probably about a year maybe even six months so that is one indicator that tells us the um the ability for bacteria to infiltrate into these types of products. It sounds like it's definitely a lot less likely in a powder product because the shelf life is much longer. It's more shelf stable for a longer amount of time without being contaminated. And um, cream products definitely have a shorter shelf life, which tells us that they're going to be a little bit more prone to contamination. Now, that's just one side of the story, of course. And we have to kind of look to science for the remaining uh, component to this answer. And and as we know, bacteria really does thrive in moist places, right? Bacteria doesn't really like to be dry. It really needs moisture in order to feed, in order to breed, and in order to survive. So powder products obviously have very little to no moisture in them. And that's part of the reason why the shelf life is so long on powder products. It's just harder for bacteria to really thrive in a powder product. And when you're looking at cream products, obviously what makes them a creamy part of that component is the fact that there's going to be moisture in these types of products. So it is going to be easier for bacteria to thrive and live in a cream product. And that's why the shelf life is going to be lesser. So the question is, you know, are products that are powder more hygienic than cream? Technically, yes, but... I think the real answer to this question just comes down to user use. Now, if you are um, not cleaning your tools, you are more likely spreading bacteria into any of your cosmetic products or, you know, just keeping it on your, your tools and spreading it back over onto your face. So I think really the, the question, the, to answer the first question is, uh, yes, powder is probably going to be more hygienic. However, there's nothing wrong with cream products if you're being hygienic about the tools that you're using, you're being hygienic about your fingers, you know, you're washing your hands before you dip it into a pot of say uh, lip gloss or something like that so I think that it is a twofold question but generally speaking if you're really worried about hygiene I would say powder is the way to go um, but if you're kind of on the fence just make sure that you're being really good with your tools with your spatulas your brushes um, your sponges and your fingers 
So question number five is, I'm using harsher products and my skin is getting so sensitive and it's burning. What can I do to heal my skin? Is it even possible? So the first answer to this is you need to focus on your moisture barrier. This sounds like a compromised moisture barrier in my opinion. We've got the hallmark signs here. Skin that was doing okay to begin with that has now all of a sudden become very sensitized, very sensitive, and you are getting like really bad burning sensation on your face. Those are just really hallmark signs of a weakened or damaged moisture barrier. So if this is you, I would really recommend checking out this video. Not only do I talk about more signs that are going to tell you if you are having a moisture barrier problem, but I'm also going to give you some tips on what you need to do to change your routine to fix it. But really what you need to do is you need to get rid of all your other skincare goals right now and just focus on your moisture barrier. And to answer your question, is it possible to turn this around to heal your skin? Absolutely. It's actually easier and quicker than we think it is. Um, but it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of boring products <laughs> to, to do it. So you really got to commit to it. But I would say your, your moisture barrier, if you really commit to healing it, it can, it can heal itself in about four to six weeks, which really isn't that long of a time. So question number six is, is sea buckthorn oil good for your moisture barrier? Will it be able to help heal the moisture barrier? And yes, my answer to this question is yes. Sea buckthorn oil is actually very good for the moisture barrier, and it's often the components in products that are geared towards moisture barrier healing. It's actually one of the ingredients that is included in one of my favorite moisture barrier products, which is Stradia Liquid Gold. Now, the one thing that I want to say before we go forward talking about why sea buckthorn oil Oil is so good for the skin. I want to make the distinction of the fact that it has to be sea buckthorn berry oil because different parts of the sea buckthorn fruit are used to make different types of oils. So you want to make sure that sea buckthorn berry oil. And the reason that it needs to be the berry oil is because the berry oil is very high in linoleic acid. Now linoleic acid is a fatty acid and linoleic types of fatty acids are actually found naturally in your moisture barrier. Those are the components that make up your moisture barrier. Now remember, when your moisture barrier is compromised, it's essentially that barrier that is inside of your skin has created holes. It's become thin in areas, and that's why it's allowing things that shouldn't be going into your skin to get past the barrier and things that shouldn't be leaving your skin to get out. So really the goal is to help patch up those holes essentially and one of the ways to do that is with the natural materials that your body is already producing by putting those back topically in your skincare products that can help to patch up those holes so sea buckthorn oil that sea buckthorn berry remember berry oil is high in linoleic acid which is naturally a component of your moisture barrier so that is why it's going to be great to help patch up those holes and question number seven is I've been using layers of Hada Labo lotion and seal it in with moisturizer, but my skin still feels dehydrated. Why? Well, this has to do with the fact that Hada Labo lotion is a hyaluronic acid toner. Now, hyaluronic acid is a powerful humectant. Humectants basically mean that even though they can moisturize the skin, the hyaluronic acid molecules themselves do not hold moisture in them. They rely on pulling moisture from the surrounding environment around the molecules to pull hydration and moisture into the molecules and that's how it moisturizes. So it's very environment dependent and when something is dependent on humidity or moisture in the environment, it's not going to perform well in dry environments. So my first question to this person who's asking would be, what is the air like where you're living right now? Is it very dry? Um, I experience very dry winters where I live here in the Midwest, and it really does take a lot of, it really zaps a lot of moisture out of all parts of your body when there's nothing in the air. So when you're putting a humectant type of product onto your skin and expecting it to moisturize your skin, but there's no water in the air for it to pull, the humectant to pull moisture from. It really can't tell the difference between the air and your skin. So what it basically does is starts pulling moisture from inside of your skin out to the surface because it's got to get it from somewhere, right? So what it does is it actually ends up dehydrating your skin because it's pulling the water from deep in the layers of your skin up to the surface. And then it actually ends up evaporating out into the very dry air. Now, of course, when you seal it in with moisturizers, that does help the, the moisture not escape out of your skin, but it can only do so much, especially if you 
you're in a very dry environment or if your skin is already prone to transepidermal water loss, just the, the fact of sealing it down with lipids isn't necessarily going to work. The composition of your moisturizer that you're putting on top of the hyaluronic acid is going to play um, into it as well. You know, if there isn't a high content of lipids that really create an occlusive barrier, if you're using another humectant type cream, just because it's a moisturizer doesn't mean it's going to lock down that, um, that hydration into your skin. So my bet would be that it's environment dependent, that your air is pretty dry. I would also say that, you know, hyaluronic acid isn't necessarily the best for dry and dehydrated skin types to begin with. And it really only works when the air is humid. If you want to learn more about hyaluronic acid, I actually just released a video about hyaluronic acid, so you should check that one out right up here. Uh, question asker or anybody who has a similar situation, hyaluronic acid is a great hydrator, but it's really not the only one, and it's not always the best one for dehydrated skin types, dry skin types, or dry environments. So I hope you guys liked that Q&A video, and if you did, please let me know because I'd be happy to do more for you guys. If you have any questions that you'd like to see answered in the next video, drop them in the comment box below. Let me know, and I will definitely do more of these if you guys like them. And if you've made it this far in the video and you're not subscribed to my channel, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just kidding. If you've made it this far and you really enjoyed this video, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It really means a lot to me when you subscribe to my channel and I release two new skincare videos every single week. Hit that little alarm bell and you'll get the notification when the new video is uploaded. I cannot wait to see you guys in the next video. I hope you're having a very beautiful day and I'll see you soon. Bye.